by far this is one of the most life-changing messages Christ has ever given me. There is a secret strategy that the enemy has been using against you and he definitely don't want you to know what it is because once your eyes are opened and you realize this warfare tactic your life will never be the same because you'll know how to overcome and by God's grace you will be able to be on watch for this particular attack. It's important that we get documentaries to you. We've been doing a lot of them lately. And we have others that are in the process of getting done. And it's very important to expose every branch on the demonic tree of mystery Babylon. There's so many different ways the enemy through the industry and Hollywood and all different, any end road he can get to try to war against you and your household. And it is important for us to expose these things, but make no mistake about it. That is important, but messages like this are far more important. If you really want to know, and hopefully you know by now, this is home to me. Dinner table messages, crying in the wilderness, these revelations that make you reflect and, and think about your relationship with Christ to draw you closer to him. That is the main calling of this ministry. This word right here is very special to me. And I'm so humbled and grateful that you're watching it. To you that are his, he loves you so much. So with that being said, I want us to get right into this life changing revelation. I want you to think about the very moment you gave your life to the Son of God. When you experienced that first love, I didn't know how to handle this supernatural agape love. I've never seen love like that. I was so excited. I wanted to tell everybody and a mama about the Son of God. And like a baby, growing and developing very fast and we all grow on different levels and I get that. I didn't know a whole bunch of things yet. I didn't know about the Illuminati. I wasn't trying to learn Hebrew and Greek. I definitely didn't have a YouTube channel, but I had the Son of God now reigning inside of me. And I would literally tell people me and a couple soldiers that gave our lives to Christ pretty much at the same time. We would literally run up on people with a Bible. And one of the first things I would say is, look, I'm still learning this book and I don't got a whole lot I can tell you, but I'm letting you know Jesus Christ, Yeshua, the son of God is real. Jesus Christ is real. And we would pray with people. And reflecting, because that's what I want you and I to do right now. Sometimes in life, you have to stop and just get alone. So you can be clear in your thoughts to be able to remember very important things of the past. And we're going to get into that. And I'm sure there's so many of you that can relate. What was it like when you first gave your life to the Almighty? When you called upon the name that's above every name? You may not have known the Hebrew, but you called on him in English. 
Jesus Christ of Nazareth, forgive me. I believe you are the Son of God. Oh, wow. Wow. And you did that prayer. You repented. You got his blood to wash you clean. What was it like for you? What was your first love experience? Like a baby crawling around. It don't know what it should eat and what it shouldn't eat. That's why it has a father and of course a mother to stop that child and say, don't eat that. You can eat this, but you can't eat that. This is how good God is that as we were babies crawling around, the Holy Spirit would watch over us, warning us. No, don't eat that doctrine. Leave that alone. No, no, no. Don't do that. Stay here. Stay at the feet of Christ and develop and grow. Come on, Nana. No, no. Let's let's continue. You and I, let's continue to reflect. Meditate. Yes, that word meditate is in the Bible, by the way. Let us think of the past. What was it like? What are the things that you had on such a strong level? Was it obedience? Were you quick to do whatever God told you to do without question? What about joy? You were just so excited. You really didn't care about nothing. It didn't matter if you had $2 in your pocket and it had a hole in it <laughs> and you lost that $2. You were so joyful that you have received salvation. For me, it was like I was living in a room with no lights on for almost 20 years. And then all of a sudden, the lights just came on. I was so excited to see for the first time. And at that moment, I didn't have a whole bunch of knowledge, especially the knowledge of what is going on in the world. I wasn't trying to learn Hebrew and Greek, and I most certainly didn't have a YouTube channel. But I had such a passion and a zeal. There it is. I had a zeal. All I wanted to do, matter of fact, how about this? I had a hunger and a thirst to read this word and to get to know the author. I had such a desire to pray. I'm not going to get into how much I would pray every day and how much I would read every day. We'll save that for a testimonial video by the grace of God. But what about you? What was it like for you? What were the things that were given to you at your first love that were so strong and unshakable? Love, forgiveness. When you received Christ for the first time, you were able to loosen those that you were bitter against. You didn't even care anymore. Oh, come on. What about grace? Wow. I, I want you to turn to the book of Proverbs chapter 22 with me. We're going to read this quickly. It's going to be Proverbs chapter 22. Look at what it says in verse 28. Remove not the ancient landmarks which thy fathers have built up. Did you hear that? Abraham is a perfect example. Whenever God, whenever the Most High God would do something very special and important to Abraham, whether it was a promise or a victory that he gave him, whatever the case be, he would put a pile of rocks and hoist it up like an altar as an altar. And it would be a place of remembrance, a memorial. This is where Christ promised me a particular thing. That is where the most high God delivered so-and-so into my hands and the list went on and on. And it wasn't just so that way, Abraham, whenever he would be passing by, when seeing that would bring him, ah, 
would bring him back to a particular memory, a particular place. Wow. But it was also for the children after him. Because the promise wasn't just for him, was it? What landmarks in your life have been removed? Wow. What is it you had in the beginning when you gave your life to the Son of God that you don't have anymore? Or maybe you have it, but it's just not the same. Man. I really don't think this video has to be too long, but I'll tell you what, it feels too strong. When Moses was holding up that rod, he needed help. That's how powerful the presence of the Lord was getting. And this one right here is such a strong word from the Lord. So I'm only asking you humbly, please don't hear my voice. Hear the voice of Christ inside of me. Don't see me. See the Son of God who's guiding me, who, who is living on the inside. Because you need this connection. And for many of you, this is an answered prayer. Oh, thank you, Lord. Because as many of you, things have not been the same for you. There's things going on in your life that have changed. For some of you, there was a time when you would read your word and you had such a passion. You didn't, need, you didn't need to force yourself to do it. It didn't feel like a chore. You were so excited to read. In fact, you were bothered when you were interrupted, when you had other th priorities and things that you had to do because, you know, we're in this world. We're just not of it. You have jobs and children and responsibilities. But you, all you wanted to really do was study the word and know the author. And when you would read afterwards, you would still be thinking about the very scriptures you were on, you were reading, and now you'd be meditating on them, chewing them as what that word means, silah, like the cows chew the grass, they chew the cud, and they, they swallow it, but then later on they'll regurgitate it back up and chew it more. You would just repeat, meditate on the word of the Lord. But for some of you now, it seems like you can't concentrate. You go to read, you can read a whole chapter, another chapter, and then you stop and you're like, I, I barely remember what I just read. What has happened to you? What has happened? For so many of you, there was a time when you would pray and you could feel the presence of God and it was strong. But now it feels like you're alone in the closet. You're numb or your mind wanders when you're trying to speak to the Most High God. And so many of you have been getting discouraged. This is an answer prayer. Because there is a strategy and a, and a tactic that the enemy does not want you to know about. That he uses on the children of the Most High God. And I'm so grateful that the Most High God would reveal this to me to give to you. Only thing I ask is you pray for my family and I. Because when you throw a rock, come on, at a hornet's nest, pray against the hornets. God is so good. He doesn't want to lose you. And he's so merciful and forgiving. He said he made it very clear in Revelation. I stand at the door and I knock. Just let me in. If you would let me in, I will enter into you and I will fellowship with you. I will have dinner with you. You know, a lot of you don't get to talk to my wife and I personally. We love you so much. But those that 
have spoken with us. They know the disappointment and the grie the grieving of seeing so many people more interested in documentaries exposing the dragon's kingdom than knowing about the kingdom of Christ. And don't get me wrong, that's part of the calling of the children of the Most High God. And, and this ministry is to expose as many things about Satan's kingdom as possible. Yes, and it's good to know those things. But why are you more interested in that? Why are you more interested in knowing about exposing the darkness rather than the light that exposes it? That alone shows you something is not right. All through the word, you can see the grievance of God where people would forget him. <laughs> I can't do this. <laughs> How would that make you feel? Maybe you've been there. When you have done things for somebody or people, but then all of a sudden they forget. And not only do they forget what you've done, they start forgetting you. And not only do they start forgetting you, they turn on you. I want you to go to Deuteronomy. Go to chapter 6. Look at what it says in verse 12. Then be aware lest you forget the Lord which brought thee forth out of the land of Egypt from the house of bondage. What has Christ delivered you from? If you start thinking about the past, if you turn around and reflect on your very first landmark, some of you was depression. <laughs> oh, really? almost to the point of suicide. Others, it was uh, addiction, pills, weed, cigarettes, alcohol, heroin, cocaine, the list goes on. But have you forgotten though? Go to chapter eight now of Deuteronomy. It says in verse two, and thou shalt remember all the way which the Lord thy God led thee these 40 years in the wilderness to humble thee and to prove thee to know what was in your heart, whether thou wouldest keep his commandments or not. You see, there's a reason why the enemy does things along this path of life that we're going to get into in a moment. To try to distract you and cause you to be so overwhelmed with the cares of the world that you stop remembering those landmarks. And one in particular that we all, we all need to go back to. And we'll get into that a little bit later. But now go to Jeremiah. Look at what it says in verse 21. A voice was heard upon the high places weeping and supplication of the children of Israel for they have perverted their way and they have forgotten the Lord their God. Did you hear that? They forgot. Not only did they forget the Lord God, but, but if you look at the strategy, their way was perverted somehow and they have forgotten. You see? You know, 1 Peter chapter 5 makes it very clear that the dragon, that old serpent, he roams around like a lion seeking whom he may devour, literally to swallow up, to eat up. What is it exactly does he want? And let's talk briefly about a few things here. One, the strategy of how a serpent hunts its prey. It will wait. It's very slow. It will hold on for the right moment to strike. Just understand, some of you were thinking you got away with certain sins that you committed. And, but you have to understand the law of punishment. Not everything happens right away, brothers and sisters. 
This is why you need this message and for you to be able to watch this. For you that are his, this is a call to repentance because he loves you. Wow. But what I want us to do now is compare when a man and woman meet for the first time that are meant to be married. Oh, come on. That first love between that husband and wife after, you know, they get to know each other within righteousness. And they realize this is the one that I am to be one flesh with, that I make a covenant with as a representation of Christ and the church because we are the bride and the son of God is the husband. In the spirit realm, we are one. He's the head and we are the body. I want you to think about that man and woman the first time they met and they exchanged numbers and they just knew within. There's something different about him. There's something different, something special about her. <laughs> now, some of you are not married and don't get all discouraged. You can still relate to this analogy, this parable that I'm giving you. Because guess what? Paul, the greatest apostle to ever live, was not married, okay? But my point is, what was it like when they first met? They couldn't get off the phone. They would talk for hours on the phone, hours, even passing out. <laughs> so excited to see each other. And I'm sure like me, many of you can relate, but let's get back to it. But what about though, after they've already gotten married and as they go on this journey down that road of marriage and being one, becoming a family, some things begin to change in time. The conversations are not as exciting. Arguments arise over nothing. And I mean, we get so many emails of people that need counseling in marriage. And look, we're not Jesus Christ. We can't get to all of y'all. Okay, but that's good. You never want to be a part of a ministry where leadership acts like they're Jesus. We are servants of the Most High God. The one who will always be available is Christ. But so many email and reach out that need counsel in marriage that their conversations are no longer the same. They're arguing. Their intimacy has been altered in all of these things. But let's compare that because you see in the first love, the little things are the biggest in a marriage, right? Even when they first got married, they went alone somewhere and it wasn't even about the intimacy only. It was the conversation, just no one there to distract them, just them being able to get to know each other even greater and spend time together. Is this not relatable to what it was like when you first met your husband, Christ? Because remember, spiritually, we are the bride. You couldn't stop thinking about the Son of God. You always wanted to read. You always wanted to be in the prayer closet and just spend time with Him. But as you went down this road, there are things that have changed. Where it's no longer a zeal and an obedience with joy to do things for your husband Christ. Now it's more like a chore. I want to show you an analogy. I want to show you a parable. Okay. This is the strategy that the enemy does. He understands this principle, but he doesn't want you to know about it. So for you to be able to watch this message, don't take it lightly. I want you to imagine that when you gave your life to Christ, 
he handed you a bag. You know, I got this burlap bag made out of like a sack cloth, a sackcloth material. And I want you to imagine that he now gave you a new life to be a new creature to send you on a journey. And on this journey, there are many trees around you. And all of these different trees are bearing different fruit. Joy, obedience, grace, love, kindness, gentleness. And of course, as you're going down the journey, there are other fruit like knowledge, speaking in tongues, the gift of dreams, and the list goes on and on and on. And your duty, your, your job is to pick this, is to pick these fruit off of the tree and put them in the bag. Okay, that's, that's your job. And let's just call this fruit right here obedience. Okay, so you pick that fruit off the tree. And this is usually one of the first things that you're taught when you give your life to Christ. You didn't arm wrestle with the Most High God when he told you to fast like you do now. You just did it. You didn't care about not eating or, oh, but I got a meeting on Thursday and they're going to have a pizza party at work. You didn't care about none of that. He said, do it. And you said, yes. So you pick off obedience and you put it in the bag and you're walking down this pathway, this journey of life. And there are so many others. Kindness. You pick off fruit called kindness off the tree. And you're learning about kindness because before meeting your first love, before meeting Christ, before meeting Christ, your husband and experiencing your first love, you really didn't know about kindness. You was quick to fight people. You was raised up in the world with all type of evil music and movies that taught us and brainwashed us to follow after the fruit of the enemy, the rotten fruit of the enemy. But you started to find out about kindness and you put it in the bag. You learned about hope and joy and you get my point. But as you're going down this journey, this path, and there's trees everywhere and you're picking off fruit off of these trees that represent different things that each serve a different purpose within your life. You didn't realize it, but there was a stalker, a wicked serpent that was slowly following in the distance, looking for perfect opportunities to hinder your relationship with your husband, to try and change your way of thinking and cloud up your mind and cause you to forget your first love. And the enemy understands that the most important fruit is what you picked off in the beginning of your walk. Grace, obedience, forgiveness, love, zeal, joy, peace. The things that you found out about, you didn't have knowledge yet because you know knowledge is good, but it puffs up, right? That's why people that get knowledge right away because of technology, a lot of people that have given their life to Christ, it's very dangerous for them because of the unlimited access they have. They don't go through the process. They, they almost cut in line, you could say, and go straight to knowledge and they get puffed up. They start learning Hebrew right away. So they think they're better than people. They start learning the different names of Christ in different languages and start putting other people down who only know how to say his name in Spanish. You see, they go ahead. They run by a whole bunch of other trees and they go straight to other trees ahead. Thinking it's more important when in reality, the very first fruit that is picked off before they start learning things online and 
getting popular on TikTok and giving a message that people wait for online. The enemy understands the mystery that I'm about to tell you. And he uses it to destroy. But as a servant of God, I'm going to expose this that you may live and that your relationship with Christ can be restored and mended. Don't forget that word, that word mended. So as you're walking along, the fruit that's most important is at the bottom of the bag. Are you following? Now, it doesn't mean the fruit that you continue to learn and experience and pick off the trees later on as you go down this pathway of life it doesn't mean it's not important. Knowledge is important. Learning Hebrew and Greek and Aramaic and all of these different things, yes, they are important. Finding out about the exposing of the enemy and all the different ways the occult is operating in society, these things are important to know. But the bottom is interesting because if you've ever had a stew, whether it's oxtail or just some kind of meat stew, a lot of people love the bottom because it's where the seasonings and it just, it's, it just hit different at the bottom as long as they don't burn it. You see what I'm saying? But it hit differently at the bottom. There's just so much flavor at the bottom than the top. For y'all that be in the kitchen, you know exactly what I'm saying. But the enemy understands this mystery. So what he does is while you're being distracted down this road of life and you're picking things off of trees and putting it into this bag, he cuts a hole. He cuts a hole in the bottom of the bag, you see? And while you're walking, the most precious things, <laughs> some of the most precious things are falling out the bottom of the bag, but you don't realize it because you're thinking, man, I'm just filling up, man. I got technology now. I can listen to a ton of stuff. I can look stuff up. I'm learning. I'm gaining knowledge. And yeah, this is amazing. But wait a minute. How come I'm not as merciful as I used to be? I noticed this. And this is something you may think to yourself. I used to be very quick to forgive. And now eh, I got to struggle to forgive people. That's because mercy fell out your bag a year ago. He cut the body. See, he's not trying to reach in from the top and pull out because that's too obvious. And that's not where the most important fruit lies. It's at the bottom of the bag, brothers and sisters. This is where the very beginning fruit was given to you. That is most important to start you on your journey. It's like when you build a house, the foundation is far more important than the attic. Yes, you need a roof, but if your foundation is not solid, in fact, Christ talks about being founded on the rock. So when the water hits and the waves and all of these things, you will remain on Christ, you see? I wanted to show you this analogy so you understand the strategy that the old serpent has been using against you. But now we gotta go and read Revelation. Think of this. The hunger and thirst that was put into your bag. Now, of course, this bag really represents you, okay? In the beginning, you were given a hunger and thirst after him, after righteousness, a desire to read, a desire to pray, obedience, to keep his commands, right? You know, don't kill. Don't commit adultery, abstain from fornication, touch not, taste not, handle not is what the word of God says in the New Testament. Yes, grace was put into that bag as well. 
But grace is a doorway, not a doormat, brothers and sisters. And see, as you kept going on this journey and slowly things been changing and you like, you know, I'm spending so much time online. I realized that when I go to read, it's not the same excitement, passion, even concentration. What has happened to me? What is wrong with me? When I go to pray, I can't focus on Christ. My mind is thinking of other things while in the very closet. It's that hole in the bag. It's that hole in the bag. Your hunger and thirst fell out. And as you were walking and walking and walking, it's dropping behind you, you see? And the old serpent is just watching, devouring. Oh, come on. But let's go to Revelation. I want you to go to chapter 2. Let us start at verse 4. It says, Nevertheless, I have somewhat against thee, because you have left your first love. Did you see that? Then he goes on to say, Remember therefore from when you have fallen and repent and do first works or else I will come unto thee quickly and will remove your candlestick out of his place except you repent. Now the first thing you have to ask yourself is, do you still have compassion and sensitivity to the Spirit of God like you used to? Or has that fallen out too? Are you convicted by what you just read? Because you should not only feel how he's being grieved that you have changed in your relationship with him, but you should also be sensitive to his love that he has for you to plead with you to come back to him. Wow. But notice, not only does he say that you have left your, that you have left your first love, but the first thing he says after that is remember. Did we not talk about this earlier? And there's so many scriptures I could have brought up about the children of Israel, even John the Baptist when he was locked up. He started to waver. His bag was opened and something fell out because clearly he started questioning if the Messiah was really the Messiah. He said, go see if he's the one or should I look for another? Because I don't know why I'm in prison. And I, I thought I was the greatest prophet. Why am I in here? You see? Remember is the first thing he says. You got to remember from whence you have fallen. What is it? Where was it? What place in your life? What time stamp was that moment you gave place to the devil? Because it makes it clear in the word of God. Give no place to the enemy. Was it fornication, masturbation, anger and bitterness, unforgiveness, jealousy, envy? You fell back into the world, smoking, drinking, listening to worldly music. And you did this for a season and it was only by the grace of God you managed to crawl back to him. But something changed in the spirit. But hold on a minute. For some of you, it may not have been weed or drugs, uh, drinking or fornication, but you fell into false doctrine. You fell into going back to the law like the foolish Galatians. You fell into pride, religious pride of thinking you're all that because you cover your head like a prayer shawl now, brother, and you walk around with an ancient Hebrew name now and you don't care about others that only know English and you have been exalted in a, in a self-righteous spirit. It ain't just those that go back to the drugs. But what has changed? Because Paul told the Galatians, who hath bewitched you? How did this serpent enter into this congregation and cut the bottom of the bag and grace fell? Ah, yeah, you're learning about Hebrew and all of the law and ancient things, but grace fell out of the bag at its expense. 
Where's the balance? At what point in your life or points, many different times you fell into that temptation and sin. And what happened was every time you committed that transgression, that sin, this hole was ripped wider and wider. You see? And because your repentance was not sincere, you were not able to repair the breach. Aww. You remember I told you earlier about that word mend. Wait though, wait, we're, we're going to get there. Remember from when you have fallen and repent. A lot of people use this word very loosely and they don't understand what it means. It, it makes me think of that old movie, very old, with uh, uh, about Tina Turner. What's love got to do with it? Now, of course, I'm not promoting the movie. This was many years ago, and I, and I remember my mother watching it. It was very disturbing to see that man, Ike Turner, beat up Tina so viciously and then come back with a bouquet of flowers the next day. Look here, girl, I'm sorry. Here. But he will continue to do it. Now, at what point do you think Tina Turner realized he really did? <laughs> he really didn't mean his apology. He wasn't really repenting. Now, I'm using that analogy to how many times you have grieved Christ. Ah. You said sorry. But you didn't mean it. You didn't mean it. You see, that word repent in the Greek is metanao. Metanao. It literally means to change one's mind. Did you hear that? But it also means to turn away and turn around. Not 360 degrees because that's what sinners do. Yeah, we're all born in sin. But a sinner is somebody who continually practices sin. A saint is not somebody who doesn't make mistakes, but it's somebody who is following Christ. They have turned away from the world. And if they happen to make a mistake, they repent and do their best never to do it again. You understand? Very simple. I got a message on that. We're not going to get into that. But we don't turn 360 degrees back to the very same thing that causes us to grieve God and break our relationship with our Christ, our King, our Lord God Almighty. No, we turn 180 degrees. You see? That way we put our back to the sin in the world. That's the very thing that's breaching the relationship and breaking the bag. And we start walking backwards. And I really believe that this revelation is so needed. And we are up against the Antichrist B system, the algorithm, this AI, the image of the beast who is alive. I mean, you can very clearly see it. Look at the latest documentaries we put out. Even the one exposing uh, the sports industry. You know how many people are messaging us, telling us when they click on it, it's saying it's not available, but it really is. That's why we have it on our website. You can watch it there. Even part two. It went, it was almost at, it was passing 100,000 views, I think in less than a day and a half. Then all of a sudden, it was like emergency brakes hit and it started trickling in. Trickling, trickling. The enemy don't want you to see what's going on in this ministry. That's why you have to make the time to check this channel maybe a few times a week. That's it and help spread the messages, hit the like button, not so I can feel warm and fuzzy, because you, it helps fight the algorithm, you understand? And leave a comment. We would love to hear from you, not promising to respond, but we love all of you and we pray for you. And we thank Christ for you that are his. But the point is, is this message right here needs to go to as many as possible. They need to understand what has happened in their walk with Christ. That they must go back to their first love. And the mystery here is that 
causing someone to stop and remember. We're, we're breaking down Revelation. We're breaking down what our, what our Lord and Savior, the King of Kings, Jesus Christ, Yeshua the Messiah, just said. You have left your first love. Now remember, therefore, start reflecting on what in your life caused you to fall. Then he says, repent. That means to turn not only your back on the very sin in the world and your own desires that caused your relationship to be tainted with Christ, but in the process of turning your back on that sin, you're now facing him again. Oh, come on. That's so good. You see, so in reality, false repentance is a 360 degree circle. True repentance is 180. False repentance is, look here, girl, I'm sorry. I didn't mean to punch you in the face. Here's some flowers and then I'll do it again two days later. Come on. True repentance is I am so sorry. I'll never do it again. You see? Now, when it comes to Christ, humble yourself and ask him to help you never to sin and grieve against him again. He will be there to help you. That's why the letter of John makes it very clear that if any be a brother and they sin, know that they have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous, to defend them if they truly repent. You understand? Remember one thing, it's very clear. He makes it, he makes it very clear here. Prove your repentance by your work, it says. Listen. Repent and do first works. You see, people always want to come against the work. Uh, it's not about work. It's only about grace. No, there is a balance. It is by grace we are saved. But to prove your repentance, it has to be by your actions, the Bible says. You can't argue with the word of the Lord, brothers and sisters. Because there is a demonic spirit that wants worldly Christians to fight against this. Like they can eat at the table of devils but wipe their lips with a grace napkin. It's very scary for people that are deceived to believe this. Christ makes it very clear. Remember where you have fallen, repent, turn away from the sin, turn back to me, and prove your repentance by your actions. Start looking at the ground. What have you dropped along the way? Oh, I, I, I dropped zeal. Oh. Forgive me, Lord, I, I'm, I don't have a zeal like I used to. I acknowledge this clearly because as I'm walking back to you, now I'm able to see how many things have fell out the hole in my bag. And now I'm able to pick it back up and put it in the bag and hold the bag, even though it's got a hole. But at least now I'm aware. I'm aware of what the enemy did to me. But here's the thing. Not only does he put a hole in the bag. But while people are distracted, he also adds to the bag, he puts a lust in there. Pride as they learn more knowledge online, you see? So it's a corruption and it's causing a lukewarm spirit. And you already know Christ said, I would rather you be hot or cold, but because you are lukewarm, I will spit you out of my mouth. But this is why the Most High God has you watching this video. You that are His. He loves you. He don't want to lose you. He wants you to hear the word of the Lord. So you will turn back to Him. And go back to that first landmark called first love. To go back to the most important landmark that has ever been created in your life. It's called first love. That is the landmark that's at the very beginning of your relationship with Christ. Do you understand? The beauty of first love is it will cause you to realize everything. You'll remember the little things that were so important in your relationship. That's why marriages that get mended and healed is when they actually start reflecting on all the beautiful things they stopped doing. The little things, the coffee in the morning he would make his wife with a little I love you note. Slowly he stopped doing that. That was big, but it didn't look so, it, 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 
it just faded out. It wasn't that important. No, that was a beautiful thing. Rubbing his shoulders when he got home from a long day working hard, that slowly no longer happened. The wife no longer did it. It ain't that big. No, little things. Having time to talk. Even though he had work to do, even after work, he got stuff to put on the computer. She had things to do, but they made time to talk about their day and smile and joke and laugh and flirt and slowly stopped happening. And now I'm too busy to talk, honey, and I'm too busy to speak to you. And even when we talk, our minds are somewhere else. Can we not compare that to what's been going on? with so many of you in Christ, while you're talking with him, you're thinking of the world, you're thinking of this, while you're reading, you're too distracted. I want you to go to the book of Haggai, chapter one. Listen, listen carefully now. Verse two going down. Thus speaketh the Lord of hosts saying, this people say, the time is not come, the time that the Lord's house should be built. Then came the word of the Lord by Haggai, the prophet, saying, Is it time for you, O oh you, to dwell in your sealed houses, and this house lie waste? Now therefore, thus saith the Lord of hosts, Consider your ways. So at this moment, they were so focused on their own lives, building their own houses, they didn't consider the house of the Most High God. Are you hearing this? Listen to this. Consider your ways. Verse 6. You have sown much, but you bring in little. You eat, but you never have enough. You drink, but you are not filled with drink. You clothe, but you're not warm. You earn wages, but earn wages to put into a bag with holes. Wait, wait a minute. A bag with holes. You see? Think about it. The prophet is saying you eat, but you're hungry. You drink, but you're thirsty. Let's compare that. Let's compare that now. You read the word, but you never get filled in a sense of you can't comprehend what you're reading. It's like, it's almost like you can't focus. You go to pray, you drink that water, but you're ne you don't feel satisfied. You feel like, what's wrong? Why is my prayer life like this? Oh, come on. Am I talking to somebody? It's time to be real. Listen, at this ministry, at this dinner table, we got to be real with one another and honest with one another. There's none of this pretend stuff that goes on in some of these other ministries that you might have left. Thank God you did. But don't bring that over here. We have to be real with each other and honest. Are you going to humble yourself and admit there are some things that are just not the same between you and Christ anymore? But admitting is the beginning of healing. Ah. It's the beginning of healing. To humble yourself and admit some things have changed. But I want to show you something. Not only does he say, not only does he talk about there's a hole in the bag. How was that hole even put there in the first place? Well, it's very clear. We see the strategy of the enemy, don't we? Hmm. But we know the bag really is you and I. And the enemy tries to cause things in our life, even trauma. You ever heard of a wounded spirit, a wounded heart, where someone struggles to forgive somebody? That could be a tear. Are you following? Committing fornication and idolatry, adultery, and all types of sin put holes in the spirit realm of you. You're leaking out. It's like pouring water into a cup that got holes everywhere or trying to fill up a tire that's been punctured in 20 different places. The air is rushing in, but the air is leaving at the same pace. 
The word of the Lord could go forth from a servant of God and people will just sit there. The word goes in, but it just leaves them because they're so torn by their own sin and by their own rebellion. And the list goes on. It's time to be repaired. So you can hold in the air, the, the breath of God. You can hold in the water, the, the, the word of God, the word of God. You can hold in that food. Wow. Wow. But look at, but watch this. Verse 7. Thus saith the Lord of hosts, consider your ways. Go up to the mountain and bring wood and build the house. And I will take pleasure in it. And I will be glorified, saith the Lord. Wow. You can continue to read, but the point is this. The Most High God was so grieved because they were all focused on their own houses, their own lives, but nobody considered building the house of the Almighty God. We know that the Holy Spirit does not dwell in temples made by the hands of man. And in, and in this last hour, you and I are the temple of Christ, right? So this means you got to build up your own walk with Christ by serving him, obeying him, going back to your word, going back to a life of prayer, fasting when you're commanded to. You will start to restore the foundation and the building and strengthen the house of God within you. But wait, did you catch it? One of the first things God Almighty commanded, listen carefully, was to go up to the mountain and bring wood. Number one, going to the mountain, if you've seen the message that God has given us to give to you called flee to the mountains, you should have watched that by now by God's grace. The mountain represents that isolation to get alone with the most high God and to go to a higher place spiritually in him. Not so you could show off as some prophet online, a prophet test, but so you could just simply get alone with him. Remember that Simon desired the Holy Spirit. He desired power because of pride and personal motives. He wanted to be someone great. True servants of God desire the Holy Spirit and power to serve God the Father, to push the gospel and fight against the kingdom of Satan. They're selfless, not selfish. Wow. But not only do you have to go to the mountain, it says bring wood. It says bring wood. This represents carrying the cross. Uh, I gotta go. I gotta go. I gotta go. You gotta carry the cross, brothers and sisters. You gotta bring the wood with you because realize this. The cross is the reminder that is never about us. And that keeps you paying attention to your bag. It's not about me. Paul said, I die daily. That means every day I wake up, I realize it's not about my will. It's not about the will of the world. It's about the will of Christ. The will of God the Father. So carrying that cross is a constant reminder to be on the lookout and protect your bag at all costs. And isn't it interesting that in the world, it's all about the bag. Whether it's females on OnlyFans or brothers on the block hustling or whatever scheme, go, whatever plan and scheme people got going on. It's all about getting the bag. But all the while... It's a mockery because we got our own bag and we got to put as much to do with the kingdom of heaven in here to strengthen our relationship with Christ. But now you got to watch out though. You got to protect this bag at all costs because the enemy, he roams around like a lion seeking whom he may devour. Are you following? But remember earlier, I told you about the word mend. I told you about the word mend, right? Well, we're not going to read it to save time, but in the book of Matthew chapter 4, when they were fishing, it says they were mending the nets. You can look it up on your own time, verse 18 going forward. But in the Greek, this word literally means to repair, to fix or heal that which is broken. Because doing fishing, they use nets and the nets would break in certain places because of all the, you know, the weight of the fish and just the elements. You get it. I mean, we don't have to go deep with that. But mending the nets, they had to literally stop. It didn't matter. 
that they had to go wash up and go back to their houses. They had response. No, you got to make sure you check the net over and over again because you're going to be wasting your time. If you don't mend the net, you're going to lose fish. Are you following? And the only way to mend the net or heal the bag or check for tears is to keep a strong relationship with Christ. To carry your cross, to carry that wood to the top of that mountain. Now, some of you might be saying, that's all good and all serving of God, but my bag is toe up from the flow up. I got more holes in that than Swiss cheese. What am I supposed to do? Turn back. You got to go back to the beginning, to that very first landmark, to the most important moment in your life called first love. And Christ will heal your back. He will mend it. He will close the holes, heal you and wash you and give you a fresh start. He loves you so much. You are so special to him. And it's not and for you that are his. It is not too late for you. It's time for you to go back to your first love. There's so many things that he tells us to remember, even when doing what we call communion, right? With the wine and the bread. He says, do this in remembrance of me. You got to remember him. Remember what he's done for you. Don't forget how he died for you. He rose from the dead. It is very healthy for you to read the end of the gospel on a weekly basis. That's on top of all your other reading in the morning time. Just read the last chapters of Matthew or one of the gospels and see the sufferings of Christ and what he did for you and I. Because then when you leave your house, you're going to be reflecting on how much he loves you and how much he suffered for you. And it's going to cause you not to want to sin. It's going to be much harder for the enemy. You understand what I'm saying? But you got to go back. And that's why he said, you have left your first love. Now remember, let's, let's break down the process. Remember where you have fallen and repent. And then as you're repenting, prove it by your actions. Because if you don't, I will come unto thee quickly and I will remove your candlestick out of his place. Except you repent. Brothers and sisters, that's how much he loves you. He's being very firm with us. And he's saying, look, I will do it. I will remove your candlestick unless you repent. He's really pleading with you. He don't want to do that. He don't want to remove you. He don't want to send you into the lake of fire. He's letting you know, look, I'm asking you to repent. Then he reminds you of what he's capable of doing by literally removing your candlestick. And I hope you know what that means. It's very terrifying. But then he finishes with repent again. He puts repent in the beginning of his warning and he puts it at the end of his warning, letting you know, I would much rather you repent than be removed and casted alive into the lake of fire forever. That's how much he loves you. So brothers and sisters, will you stop and turn around? Let, let me just say it like this. Sometimes in life, the only way for you to move forward is to turn around. It's to turn around. Sometimes in life, the only way forward is a turn around. Sometimes in life, the only way ahead is a turn around. Sometimes in life, the only way forward is a turn around. And when you go back, make sure you look on the ground and pick up the precious pieces you dropped. Along the way
can tell that things ain't the same every time I go to pray That's why I'm going back to my first love, oh I've gone astray Sometimes in life the only way forward is a turn around Sometimes in life the only way ahead is a turn around Sometimes in life the only way forward is a turn around Pieces you drop along the way Things you used to do in words you no longer say I can tell that things ain't the same every time I go to pray That's why I'm going back to my first love Oh, I've gone astray Sometimes in life the only way forward is a turn around Sometimes in life, the only way ahead is a turn around. Sometimes in life, the only way forward is a turn around. And when you go back, make sure you look on the ground. chose not to wait for me Where would I be if you didn't want to wait for me Sometimes in life the only way forward is a turn around Sometimes in life the only way ahead is a turn around Sometimes in life the only way forward is a turn around Sometimes in life the only way forward is a turnaround 